Well, the text that I'm going to be using this morning is going to come from Galatians 3, but I just want to give you a brief overview of the book of Galatians just to kind of get in context of where we're at. The whole book of Galatians is excellent as far as using it for soul winning, trying to explain that salvation is just by grace through faith alone. It's, it has nothing to do with the works of the law. And the reason why it's, it's like that is because the church at Galatia was, seemed to be having a problem with this. There was some heresy being spread in the church. So we're going to flip back real quick. This is chapter number one. We're just going to hit a few verses real quick to kind of, we're going to jump around just to show you kind of what the whole point of the book of Galatians is, to show you where we're coming from here before we just jump right in the middle of the book in chapter three. So Galatians one, verse number six says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ Unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So right in the early on here in his epistle, he is addressing them. And then he says, you know, I, I, it's marvelous to me. I'm wondering how in the world is, is it possible for you to have so quickly gone from embracing salvation, the free gift, that it's, that it's simply by believing in Jesus Christ, right? And, and, and now you've moved and your, your gospel has become corrupted. Your gospel has become perverted. He's basically saying, how does that happen so clearly? There's people troubling you. you know, so somewhat, what, what's happened is that someone or a few people have come in and have challenged their doctrine of salvation. And they're shaky on this. They're, 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 they're being troubled by these people who, and he says, it's not another gospel, it's a perverted gospel. So they're still including basically probably the majority of the aspects of salvation, but it's that perversion that makes it false. And in this case, as you read the entire book, what you're, probably, what you're going to find out is that they're probably introducing circumcision because he goes into circumcision in this book and that is something as you read some of the other books of the New Testament that that was, seemed to be something that people were still trying to push that, well, no, you need, to, you need Christ, you need to believe in that, but you also need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And they were trying to get their new converts to become circumcised. And... When you add anything, it's the same thing today as people who want to say, no, you got to believe in Christ and all this other stuff, but you got to be baptized in order to be saved. It's the same thing. You're adding something. You're perverting the gospel even just a little bit. And see, the problem is when you pervert the gospel, all of a sudden it's, it's a lie. It's false. You can't be saved when you believe. Well, say, so yeah, but you believe in Jesus, but if, you also have to be baptized you're not saved. If that's, your, you know, if that's what you're trusting, if you're trusting in Jesus plus anything else, you're not saved. That's not salvation. That is not the gospel. The gospel is faith in Jesus Christ alone. And this is the problem that the church of Galatia was struggling with. They started off great. I mean, the apostle Paul went around and was preaching the gospel and getting people saved and starting churches up. And he's writing these epistles now to these churches, helping them, you know, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. The church at Galatia had some problems here, especially with the doctrine of salvation. And, he, and he's writing these epistles, trying to get everything straightened out. And the epistles that he was writing happened to be the Word of God. It's Scripture. And that's what we rely on to get all of our understanding from. And then in chapter 2, he goes, you know, chapter 1, he starts off just saying, look, how is it that you've, be, you, you've already being swayed away unto another gospel, which is just a perversion of the gospel? Chapter 2, verse number 1 says, then 14 years after, he explains his own conversion, how as soon as God called him and Jesus Christ sent him out, he says in, in chapter 1, he's like, I didn't, con you know, I didn't go and ask permission or go and see what the other apostles, you know, had for me to do. When he got his orders from Jesus Christ, he's saying, I just went out and did it. I just went away. I just, just right away. Okay, God, I'm going. And, 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 you know, he sent me, so I'm going. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. So now he's saying in chapter 2, 14 years after, now he makes his way back around to Jerusalem. It says, with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And now he's finally coming back and he's going to talk to some of the people there. And then it says in verse number three, but neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, 
which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So when he went back to Jerusalem, there were some people that says they're false brethren. They're people in there looking to start problems and to spread heresies and to split the church and to bring in damnable heresies. They're, they're not saved. They're false brethren. They're, they're, and the reason why they're called false brethren is because they're in the church. They want to make you think like they're part of the church too, right? Oh, yeah, we, we believe the same. But then they start just, just introducing these heresies. And that's why he says, you know, Titus was a Greek, right? Titus was a Gentile. Titus was a convert from a Greek. He was not a Jew. He was not circumcised. <coughs> but what these people at Jerusalem were trying to do was to compel him to become circumcised. As in, well, you know, you still, you know, this is still something you have to do. Oh, you know, believing in Christ isn't enough. You have to be circumcised, right? And they started trying to compel him. And the false brethren are getting worse. But they came in privily. It means privately, right? They came in under the radar to spy out our liberty that they might bring us into bondage. And what's a bondage? Going back to some form of the law, introducing works of salvation, getting brought back into that bondage. And he says, to whom we gave sub place by subjection? No, not for an hour. So did they sit down and have this full discussion with them? No. He says, we didn't give place to them, not even for an hour. They rebuked them. They said, no, you're wrong. This is a heresy. You know, basically, get out. He says that the truth of the gospel may continue in you. So he brings up this story. And this is an important message, too. And this isn't really what my, you know, the, this kind of steers a little bit from the point of the, of the sermon. But in Jerusalem, you had the apostles. You had a lot of people who were following Christ at that time. And... We always have to be careful that we don't put too much authority in any man. Even the apostles, you know, even the apostles that were, that were with Christ and they had the word of God. I mean, they, they, they did a lot of great work and a lot of great teaching and everything. But you could see what some of these churches were doing. And again, in the Corinthians, how they were, oh, I'm a follower of Cephas. Oh, I'm a follower of, you know, of all these different men. Right? The apostle Paul is like... <laughs> No, yeah, we're, we're, we're all followers of Christ, okay? That's who we follow, you know? It's a, that's who, who we get our, our faith from. That's, that's who we get everything from is Jesus, you know? We, we shouldn't be so caught up in lifting one man up above another and everything else. That's not where it needs to be. And, and what we see here in chapter 2 is that the Apostle Paul even needs to confront Peter because Peter's wrong. Peter's screwed up. Peter does something that's not right. And we'll read that here in verse number 14 when he needs to be corrected. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And again, excellent verse there for soul winning. You know, Galatians 2, 6, I have it highlighted in my Bible. <coughs> but even Peter was getting caught up in, in these, with, the, with the doctrine that the false brethren were, were spouting off there. Not to the point to where he thought you had to be circumcised to be saved necessarily, but he wasn't eating with the Gentiles. He was separating himself when Apostle Paul said, no, that's not right. You're wrong. And he was stood him to the face and called him out and said, you're wrong on this. And he was wrong on this. And that, you know, obviously we have, we have scripture to prove that. So now we get to, and, and he's bringing up these examples. He, he, he's saying what happened to him. Here's what happened at Jerusalem. Because it all relates to what's going on in Galatia. Because in Galatia, they have false brethren that have, that have crept in unawares. And that's where we come up to verse number 1 in chapter 3. O oh, foolish Galatians, look at this. Who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? And this is where I get the title of my sermon this morning. Who hath bewitched you? And the reason why, what we're going to be preaching on this morning is that phrase, because it is possible 
for saved people to be deceived by false doctrine, by people who are going to bring in damnable heresies, even in this sense where there's being a perversion of the gospel going on for people who are saved to get to start to stray away from that truth. And he's saying, you know, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who is it? Who's responsible for this? Because if you would have been staying in what I taught you, you'd be just fine. Someone has come in and brought this to your attention. You didn't get this just from your reading of the Bible. Someone came in and taught you this false doctrine. And the whole scope of my sermon this morning, we'll be focusing in on being very diligent with where we get our source of information and how we learn and where we're going to get our understanding of the Bible and who we allow to teach us. Because we don't want to get caught having some false prophet inserting damnable heresies that are going to influence the way that we believe, the way that we act, the way that we think. Look at chapter number four. Because now he's going to continue to go on about these people who they are that have bewitched them. Chapter four, verse 15. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. He's speaking about how they received the Apostle Paul, how even though he had a thorn in the flesh, even though he had some type of disability, they didn't hold that against him. They didn't, they didn't not treat him. He says, you know what? You would have plucked out your own eyes for me. That's how much you love me. That's how much you received me. That's how much you would just, just accepted the words, you know, the, the word of God that I was preaching unto you. Verse number 16, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So I'm saying, now you're going to turn on me just because I'm speaking the truth to you because I'm calling this out and I'm saying that this is right and this is wrong. I'm, pre I'm preaching the truth now. Are you going to be my enemy? Verse 17, they... So about the people that have crept in, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. False prophets might be very zealous and they might zealously affect people, but not well. And we need to be careful just because someone seems to be very animated or dynamic in the things that they say doesn't mean that they're of God, right? We, we, you know, people can become very good orders. People can be very well with their words. And it doesn't mean, you know, I, I went in the church that I grew up in as a Presbyterian church. When, uh, when I was out of, of the children's church type of thing in the, in the, in the, what we, what we called Sunday school. Um, and I became a, a member of the church and actually sat through service. That was the worst in my mind because it was so boring. And the, 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 the regular pastor, the head pastor, whatever, really dry, really boring, almost falling asleep almost every time in church, right? Just, just horrible to sit through. But there was another guy who was a youth pastor, pastor, youth pastor. He was an associate pastor. He was really good with his words. He was really good at tugging at the heartstrings, right? He was really good at bringing up these examples and getting people to tears. Not preaching any truth in the Bible, mind you, but just a really good speaker. Really, you know, everyone. And I love to listen to him because he was interesting. He was dynamic. He was someone that could hold my attention, right? At the end of the day, I didn't learn anything, but, but this is the, you know, that, that type of charisma that he had. He was zealous. He was able to zealously affect people, but not well. I believe that guy today, is, I believe he's a reprobate. And, again, and, and you know, I, 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 it doesn't matter. You guys don't know who it is or anything like that. But um, looking back and knowing what I know now, because I sat through that church being unsaved. I didn't know anything and, uh, and, and now, after I've learned a lot more, after I've gotten saved and learned a lot, I can look back in hindsight and be like, yeah, I think that guy was a, was a total reprobate. And it's not surprising because there are many, many, many youth pastors yeah. that are reprobates. That the reason why they even get in that job is because it gives them access to children. It puts them in a, in, in a, in a position, and they're in a position of power. 
and they go off on these camping trips and they go off and do these these getaways and things and and all kinds of horrible things happen there and um, anyways I don't want to get off too far on that subject turn it if you would to Galatians chapter 5 we're seeing another reference to the same people here verse number 7 you did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? They're saying, who is it? Who are these people that are giving you this false doctrine? Verse 8, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. This didn't come from God. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would, they were even cut off, which trouble you. Paul wants those people out of there. He wants them gone. He wants them just completely cut off. <coughs> With their perverted, damnable doctrine. They're not going to say, oh no, let them in here. If they stay long enough, maybe they'll come around. Maybe they'll finally realize the truth. No, the people who are spreading these heresies, he said, they don't belong there. They don't belong with you. I, I, I wish they would just get out of there. You, know, you guys would just cut them off and get rid of them. He says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And this is a, a key um, point to understand when it comes to w how we receive our doctrine and who we're listening to. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much of a perversion of the gospel to make it a lie. It doesn't take much of a perversion of the gospel to send people to hell. It doesn't take much of false doctrine to enter in to start corrupting all of your doctrine. It really takes very little. And one of the reasons for that being, you know, just a little bit of an explanation, the entire Bible has to be reconciled within itself. You have to be able to, 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 to understand all the concepts of the Bible and, and be able to reconcile whatever it is that you, you are going to hold to as doctrine. Whatever you're going to say, this is what the Bible says, this is true, it has to line up and not contradict any other teaching in the Bible, right? So when one area starts to get tweaked, it starts to get shifted, it starts to get perverted, it will have an influence on other doctrines that you hold. It has to, because in order now to reconcile this that you believe, well, this other thing has to be, you know, a good example of this, very, very common is the... Um, the pre-tribulation rapture is a doctrine that's held. And in order to hold that doctrine, you have to reconcile things like Matthew 24. You have to reconcile you know, other areas of the Bible that will, that will clearly spell things out, but you have to make an explanation for that. So now you start to say, well, you start to become maybe dispensational. Say, so, well, this was just for this group of people at that time. Now we're in a different time period and things are going to be acting different in this time period. So they start introducing these other doctrines to compensate. Or you have to be, you know, like a, like a Zionist or, or something where you believe that God, you know, that, that, that physical Jews are special people and that they, you know, that, that there is, that God's a respecter of persons in that sense and that just everything's going to happen different for, for anyone who's a physical Jew as opposed to everybody else. You know, there's, there's different things. And, then, and that's where you start looking at the word elect and who are the elect. And, all, you know, and the more you dig into it, in order to make the doctrines fit you, I mean, there has to be all these various things for it to work, right? The doctrines, they, they, all, they, 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 have to, um, they have to go fit together right. So when you add a little bit of leaven, it's going to leaven the whole lump. You're going to end up having all kinds of, of problems with what you believe if you're trying to be consistent with scripture at least if you're trying to be honest with scripture as opposed to just picking and choosing randomly oh, i believe this i don't like that right. now the bible says here in galatians 3 you know that the, the galatians were bewitched by someone teaching a false doctrine you don't have to turn there turn if you would to second peter chapter one but in acts chapter eight there's only one other place in scripture where that word bewitched is used and it's in acts chapter eight and I'll read it for you. In verse 9, the Bible reads, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. 
So this is talking about a man that's, that's, that's bewitching them, that's using sorceries and, and, and trying to, to wow them right, with his tricks, with his deceitfulness, with his sorcery to, to put their faith in him, put their confidence in him. And there are many false teachers out there that will try to do something similar. They're going to try to wow you. They're going to try to, you know, oftentimes they'll use these little cute phrases that you think are just so profound. And oftentimes they're just a lie or they're just, you know, they're just trying to use something to get you to be like, wow, this guy's full of wisdom. When if they're a false prophet, they have, they have no wisdom. Um, <clears throat> so it is possible, as we've already seen clearly, for people who are saved to get mixed up into some really weird false doctrine. So where should we be getting our teaching from? If you look at 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 18, the first place that we should be getting our, our teaching from is straight from Scripture, directly from the Word of God, and not from someone else's interpretation of that Scripture but just straight from the Word of God. This is the number one primary source for where we should be getting what we believe, directly from the Word of God. Look at verse number 18. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. This is Peter recounting when Peter, James, and John went up to the mount and it was at the transfiguration of Jesus Christ and they heard the voice from heaven. They heard God the Father speaking. <laughs> to and about Jesus Christ. And he says, we heard the voice from heaven when we were with him in the Holy Mount, verse 19. We have also, look at this, a more sure word of prophecy. He's calling the Bible a more sure word of prophecy than what he actually heard with his ears. So something that he heard with his ears, he's saying, you know what? That's great. And I was there and it was awesome. And, you know, and I believe it. I heard it. But I have something that's even more sure. A more sure word of prophecy, which is scripture, which is written, you know, and even at this time, you know, you can't, he didn't have all the New Testament, but he had the Old Testament. He had scripture. He said, I have a more sure word, even more sure than what I can hear audibly with my ears. We don't have to hear audibly the word of God to have something that we, a foundation that we could believe in and trust. We've got the scripture. And this is a sure word. And it says, Whereunto um, ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, people will tell me all the time, and I talk to people at the doors especially, you know, well, everybody says something different. Everyone's got their opinion. Everyone believes different things. And that's true. There's a lot of people out there that believe all kinds of different things. That's why you have all these different denominations and all these different churches, and you can look at a passage, and people can come up with different things, but it doesn't make them all right, and it doesn't mean that, that it's okay, you know, in God's eyes, that there's all these different interpretations of the Bible. Because the Bible, and, and this is one of the reasons why we take the approach at Word of Truth Baptist Church of the surface meanings are what they say. When you read the Bible, it means what it says. We're not going to take a scripture, for example, that says that women are to keep silence in the church and say, well, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. This is why it's okay to have a female pastor. I know that that's what the Bible says. But you don't understand the culture at the time. You don't understand what the Greek means. You don't understand, you know, whatever the reasoning is that people want to come up and say the Bible doesn't mean what it says? No prophecy of the Scripture is a private interpretation. Right. That's what we say. That's what we believe. Mm -hmm. If it says it, God wrote it, we believe it. We have to be able to accept what it says at face value. Now, obviously, there's a lot more deeper meanings, and you could really get into some, some really cool um, uh, teachings. And, and you start digging down deep, but you, you, we have to rely on our doctrine and our scripture coming from what, a plainly, what the scripture plainly says and what it teaches on service. If you have to start doing a bunch of mental gymnastics and acrobatics to try to get some teaching to, to, to hold up, it's probably not right. right. It's probably not. I mean, when you have to just, Amen. I mean, bounce around all over the place. Well, you see this here. You take, you take this half of a verse here and you mix it with this one. You know, it's like... No, you know, we've got to take the whole thing in context. 
Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And again, this is all, you know, just to prove, because I didn't, I, didn't, I forgot to do this, why the more sure word of prophecy is the scripture, it's the Bible, is because in verses 20 and 21, he goes on about the scripture and about how we received it. And that is the more sure word of prophecy. It is in the scripture. That's what we have to go off of. And that's if we want to know what we're supposed to believe, it comes directly from his book. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Because the Bible has all of the answers. Now, God has given us teachers. God has given us people to help us understand the Bible. So I'm not saying that the only way you should learn the Bible is by just reading it for yourself, and that's it. No. That's the primary source. That's where we go to first. This is where we go with, 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 with everything. But there are definitely teachers, right? And this is why we're even covering false prophets, because if we could say, oh, well, you don't have to worry about false prophets because you shouldn't be listening to any prophet. If that were the case, then you shouldn't be here this morning, right? <laughs> because then you wouldn't be listening to anybody preach. But Ephesians 4 is going to explain that, no, 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 God, God has given people gifts. And there are, there are people that you could learn from, that you could listen to, that you could receive instruction from. Everything, first of all, has to line up with Scripture. It has to line up with God's Word. No matter who's saying it, no matter, no, you know, no matter where you're at, it has to line up with Scripture. But we can get our teaching from teachers. Look at verse number 7 here in Ephesians chapter 4. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And it goes on and on talking about the body here. And this explains, and I always, I like to show this verse, this passage to people that underestimate the importance of church and attending church and coming to church, being around, uh, you know, being a part of the local body, the local assembly, where there are different members, where everybody has a function, where everybody here is doing things. Ephesians 4 explains this, but in the very first part that we read, God has given gifts unto people, a directly gifts given to God unto certain people to be teachers, to be pastors, to be these pre you know, to be people to help you to understand the Bible. God has given certain people gifts in order to help with the explanation, to help the understanding, to really break down the Scripture and make it easily understood so that everybody can get what the Bible's saying. That's why it says it's for the perfecting of the saints and the edifying of the body of Christ. It says so we all come in the unity of the faith. God wants us all believing the same thing. He wants us all believing what's true and right. We all, he wants everybody to know all of the truth and that we all are just in agreement with it and say, yes, this is what the Bible says. And the importance here with, with the apostles and the evangelists, the teachers, the pastors, verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children because they're going to help you to grow. When you get saved, you're a spiritual child. You're a baby. You're an infant. You don't know anything. You know how you got saved and that's about it. You need to now learn and grow and, and receive more truth and start to grow. He says that we henceforth be no more children. And church is going to help you to do that. When you go to church, you're going to grow. You're going to learn some new doctrines. You're going to get some stuff fed to you where the work has already been, the meal's been prepared. When the pastor goes and spends his time making all the notes, checking everything out, putting all the scripture together to, to just to, to prove a case, to show you a clear teaching from the Bible, that's preparing the meal. Right? You get fed. You should be fed. I mean, that's what the church is for, too, by the way. 
If you're going to a place, you're going to church, and you're not being fed, you're not getting, you know, you're not getting doctrine, you're not digging into God's word and just and just going through what it says and, and you'll hear an explanation from, from exactly what this, Bible, what this word says, you need to find another church. You need to go somewhere where you're going to be fed. Amen. And the point of this is that we that we're not any longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, a child gets, it's a lot easier for someone who's spiritually young to get deceived by false doctrines, by false teachers, by false prophets. And it's just a matter that you don't understand that much. So when someone says something that, that you know, well, that makes sense in a way, when you don't know the rest, of, you know, when you don't know the Bible for yourself, you don't, don't know scripture, kind of back up, say, no, no, wait, what he's saying isn't right because... The Bible says this somewhere else, right? They are, there are very people, you know, and it's a people here, it says, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. False prophets are crafty in the way that they put together their false doctrine. I mean, they want you to buy it. They want you to believe it. So they put things together in a way that's, that's going to be believable to those who don't know Scripture very well, to those who are young and they get tossed to and fro. Oh, well, that sounds great. Yeah. And he's using the Bible. I love it. Sounds good. And you receive things. Right? I could think of, you know, even in Galatians, maybe the people were thinking, they're already saved. They got saved by grace through faith. But, they're, but now, you know, as many people who get saved, you want to show respect unto God. You want to do what's right in His eyes. You want to live right. And when people start saying, well, no, no, you see, you got to be circumcised and see the circumcision is, you know, maybe they even start to tell you the, the truth about circumcision in, in, as far as representing your separation from the world. See, now you're different. Now you're saved. But you need to be circumcised. And that aspect of it sounds great because maybe it's true. But then they sway them into thinking, well, no, we must be circumcised now in order to be saved. So, so you start hearing some of this good stuff and it, you know, it appeals to you and they're, they're presenting it to you in such a way. And then they hit you with that perverted part, and you're already on the hook. It's cunning craftiness. And we got to be diligent because we don't want the little bit of leaven to get into our doctrine. That's right. We need to watch out where we're getting our information from. But we're going to keep reading here in Ephesians chapter 4. I think we left off here in verse number 16 from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. By that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the, in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all in cleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Taught by him. That's where we should be getting our teaching from. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying... Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Do you remember in Galatians where he says, We didn't give place unto them, no, not for an hour. He didn't give them a place. He didn't give them an opportunity to preach their false doctrine. So we shut it out. When someone's coming in and preaching a false gospel, you don't have to, he wait, no, hear it all out. A perverted gospel? No. You want to talk about some of the finer points and finer doctrines and we can sit down and talk about it? Great, that's fine. But someone who comes in preaching a, 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 a perverted gospel, I'm not going to sit down and hear you out. You're not going to change my mind about what I believe about salvation. I'm sorry. I'm closed-minded on that front. I have nothing more to learn as far as what does it take to be saved. I know what it takes to be saved. And if you try to add something to it, I'm going to shut you down as a heretic and I don't even want to talk to you. I'm not going to give you place. No, not for an hour. Amen. I'm not going to give place to the devil. That's right. Because Satan's going to come in and try to deceive you. Now again, 
That's why I'd be careful. You know, I'm not, we're not talking about like every single thing that I believe about the Bible I'm just shut off to. I'm open and I have enough humility to be able to say, well, I'm going to believe what the Bible teaches. But there are certain things that are foundational that you're not going to change what I believe. You're not going to change what I believe about being saved. Just, it's not going to happen. And I'm not going to give place to someone trying to tell me why it's of works or why you need to be baptized or whatever. And in verse 25, I think it's important too, it says, wherefore, putting away lying. When we're receiving our information from people, when you're, you're determining who you're going to let teach you, who are you going to, what, what are you going to let come into your mind? Who are you going to let affect you? Who are you going to let zealously affect you? Right. If you find them to be a liar, you ought to put them away. Put away lying. When you find out that they have a, a false gospel, for sure, don't give place to the devil. But there's all these things that sound so good. When you find out that, they're, that they're, they've got a false gospel, they've got a false, you know, they've crept in unawares. Put them away. Now, you notice who God gave us. Prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It doesn't say authors. It doesn't say YouTube doesn't say a lot of things. I think one of the reasons for that is, is that, you know, bishops and deacons must be proven before they even get to that, that office, that position that they take. 1 Timothy chapter 3 goes through all the requirements that a pastor or a deacon must possess, the attributes that they must possess, in order to even be considered to fill that role, to fill that function, to fill that job. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.10 says, And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. It is, it is an important task. It's an important job. When you're, when you're going to say, we believe that this person should be a teacher. This is someone who should be preaching and running things and, and running a church. Better make sure that you're, you got the right guy going there and it's not just some novice, it's not someone you don't know, it's not someone who hasn't been vetted, but someone that is found blameless. Someone you could say, this person has been upright. This person believes. This person's been doing the work. This person is approved. Now we're going to say you could teach. And that's the way that God ordained it to be in Scripture, based, especially based off of 1 Timothy 3 as well as Titus 1 and other places. Now, because God ordained this, does that mean that all other books other than the Bible are bad? No. I'm not saying that either. Okay? Look, I read books. I read books written by men. But I'm going to be very, very, very careful what the content of the book is, what are they writing about, and those types of things, and especially who is the author of the book? Who is it? I mean, can't a God-ordained teacher write a book? Sure they can. Now, that's not the method that God laid out for how we receive our teaching, but it doesn't, necessarily, it doesn't inherently mean that it's bad or wrong. Right? I mean, it doesn't mean that. I'm not going to add anything to Scripture, but when we look at what the Bible, you know, the, the primary sources, who God has given to us, right? He's given us these uh, pastors and teachers Okay, let's just say, you know, re again, I don't have any problems with it. But the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast to that, which is good. So we definitely are responsible for pro proving, testing what we receive, no matter how we receive it. You receive something from the internet, you receive something from a book, you receive something from preaching, you receive something from, you know, from another believer, from you know, whatever. We need to prove all things. We need to be diligent in that with what we believe. And I've said this before, and I'll keep on saying it until I'm blue in the face. You don't, I don't expect you, and I don't want you, to just blindly believe everything that I say either. Right. Because I'm just a man also. I believe that I've been given gifts from God, and to be in this position. And I've been found faithful, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, to be in the position I'm in. And I, you probably believe the same thing, otherwise you wouldn't even be sitting here this morning. Because why would you be? I wouldn't be if I thought someone shouldn't be, shouldn't be, you know, up, the, you know, pastoring a church or whatever, wasn't qualified. I wouldn't be there either. <clears throat> I 
But you need to test what's being said and what's being taught with everything. And, and, and again, the foundation is the Scripture. It's the Bible. Is what Pastor Burson is saying, is it lining up with what the Bible says? And that's what ultimately what we're responsible for and we have to believe. Now, how can you prove an author that you don't know anything about? And see, the Bible shows us that as a teacher or as a pastor, you need to prove your ministry. The Apostle Paul said unto Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, and do afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. It's important that you can prove your ministry. So you can give people a reason to trust you and to listen to what it is that you have to say and, and believe that you're not just some false prophet. But, again, you know, people online, on YouTube, on the Internet, articles that are written. Who wrote that article? Who did it? Who, who, who is this person preaching on YouTube? I mean, we publish stuff to YouTube. Does that mean it's wrong? You don't know. I mean, just because there's other people who are false prophets teaching there, does it make it wrong? No. I mean, that would be like saying that, uh, you know, there's false prophets preachers and churches, so never go to a church. No, that's, that's obviously that's not true. But you need to be able to test for yourself and prove what is this person saying? What is this person writing? And I think the, the first place to start is who is this person? Who are they? I'm not going to just start reading, for example, a bunch of Catholic Pope writings. Right. To help me understand the Bible. It's, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Oh, but there's this really great article. And they talk about how merciful God is and how, you know, and, and it's written really well. And it's, and it's impactful and, and it's going to help you in your life. I'm not going to do it. They have a false gospel. I am not going to get my teaching from somebody like that. Amen. Now that's an easy example. But what about the, the, the thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of authors and people writing stuff on, you know, just it's everywhere? Where are we going to turn to for our source of information? We need to prove things. Now, false prophets exist, and the best ones are the most subtle. Just like the best counterfeit money is going to be the one that looks just like every other dollar bill, right? Or $100 bill, whatever. If you want a good counter, but it could look almost identical and it could fool you, but it's still fake. It's still not true. It's still a deception. False prophets are going to come to you looking really good because that's what they're trying to do is to deceive you. That's why they're called false brethren. They want to come to you as a brother, as a brother in Christ. Look really good. Talk the talk, right? Hey, brother, God bless you. How you doing? Hallelujah. Get all the words down right. Praise the Lord. Because they want to gain your confidence and teach their, their false doctrines. Now, I'm going to read for you. You could turn if you would to Jeremiah um, 23, if you'd like. Jeremiah. I'm going to read from Jeremiah 14. And Jeremiah, they're, they're struggling with false prophets. And the, the false prophets in Jeremiah's day... Remember, this was during the time when the children of Israel were about to and then did, were taken captive by the Babylonians, right? That's when Jeremiah was preaching. He was warning. He was preaching. He was telling them, hey, here's what's going to happen. Hey, and, you know, and, and the message from God was, he was saying, okay, you're going to be judged. Okay, go along with this. Don't fight. Okay, now you're going to be taken captive. Just let it, you know, and he was, he was giving them the word of the Lord. But he was teaching that, Captivity was coming. Before the captivity came, guess what the false prophets were saying? Oh, you guys are doing great. God's with us. These people can't take us. We're going to be strong. We're going to fight. God's with us. He'll protect us every bit of the way. There's peace. Don't listen to this guy talking about war and people coming and taking hostage. We're doing great. We're having prosperity. Everything's going well. That's what the false prophets were saying in Jeremiah's day. Don't worry about your sins. They didn't even mention sins. Peace, peace. When there is no peace. 
Jeremiah 14, 14 says, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. What are they doing? They're saying, Hey, God said we're going to have peace for the next 100 years. God didn't say that. They're lying. Prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. It's coming from their own heart. I didn't tell them any of this stuff. But people like to throw that word around. Oh, I got a word from the Lord. Oh, God told me this. Oh, God told me that. And they go and speak something that's out of their own heart. We need to be able to recognize, because and this is important too, there is a leading and a prompting if you're saved by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of God to help lead you and direct you into the path that you ought to go. Amen and amen. I believe that. I've experienced that. I know that to be true. But we have to be careful that what you feel isn't being misconstrued as the Holy Ghost. And it's not just coming out of your own heart. As people, we like to think that everything we think and do is right. We do. I mean, no one wants to think that you're doing something wrong. And especially when you have an honesty of it within yourself of just, I want to please God. And this is how you approach your life. Because you think that way, and because you have this zeal and this concern and this, this honest, sincere you know, desire to serve God, we have a tendency to think that, well, everything I'm doing must be right yeah. then. It happens. Look, I, I know this happens because it happens to me sometimes. I'll be doing something. It's like, well, you got to take a step back. I say, wait a minute. No, no. Hold on a minute. Because what I just did doesn't line up with Scripture. Okay? It doesn't matter how sincere I am. It doesn't matter if I have a warm and fuzzy feeling in my heart about what I'm doing. If it's against God's Word, I mean, it's sin. I'm wrong. And we need to be careful that we don't misconstrue a feeling especially as the Holy Spirit when you don't know that. The, the Mormons do that all the time. I talk to a Mormon that says, you know, well, how, you know, how do you know that the Book of Mormon isn't true? They'll ask, they'll ask you. How do you know the Book of Mormon isn't true? Because well, it contradicts Scripture. They say, well, here's what I did when I wanted to know if the Book of Mormon was true or not. Because what we're supposed to do, you know, we, we pray to God and God's going to give to every man. He's going to give you that understanding. So I, what I did, and it, I mean, every Mormon says this. So I prayed to God one night. I got on my knees. I prayed to God. God, is the Book of Mormon true? And I was overwhelmed with this warm feeling, which confirmed to me that God answered my prayer and the Book of Mormon is true. It's what they say. And anyone who's gone out soul winning long enough and has talked to Mormons knows exactly that what I'm saying is true. I mean, it happens all the time. They're trusting in a feeling and an emotion and not in Scripture. We need to be careful because, you know, just because they're unsaved doesn't mean that they're the only ones that, that, can, that are affected by that. We need to make sure that we're not just trusting in our emotions out of the things that come out of our heart. The false prophets preach out of their own heart. And whatever comes into their mind, whatever, you know, they, they claim the name of God. They claim the name of the Lord. But God didn't say those things. I'm sick of hearing these people, you know, like I, I've been to a Christian church for a funeral once and he's, you know, I got a word from the Lord last night and he's talking, on 40, he's talking to like, this guy died and, and he was pretty young and he had family and he had younger children and this pastor was up there saying, the Lord told me to tell you, and he's talking to the son of the guy that died. And I'm thinking, no, the Lord didn't tell you to give this message to him because are we going to start opening up our Bibles and start writing down now because God said you need to tell this person this, that, that God said this to you? We've got to be careful with our words. If God didn't actually say something, don't say that he said something. If you feel led to comfort somebody, that can be from the Holy Ghost. But don't put words in God's mouth, the Lord said when the Lord hath not said. 
God's word is really important. Add thou not unto God's word, lest thou be found a liar, and he reprove thee. I believe that's in Proverbs 30. We're going to be doing that this week. Uh, you're in Jeremiah 23, right? I'm going to finish up in verse 15 of Jeremiah 14. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy my name, and I sent them not. They, yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. See, those are the prophets saying, no, there's no, you know, there's not going to be a sword coming. There's no battle coming. There's no famine. We're not going to be besieged. They're, they're not, you're not going to have, you know, any problems. Everything's going to be just great. God says, yeah, you know what I'm going to do to them? By those very things that they say aren't going to happen, that's how they're going to die. By those very things. Look at Jeremiah 23, verse 25. I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The false prophet's always going to try to use mysticism and things like dream. Oh, because how can you prove that? Look, if someone came to you and said, I had this dream and God spoke to me and God said this and I saw these visions and this is what's going to happen in the future. And you say, I've had all these dreams. How do you prove that? The only way to prove a prophecy of things that's going to happen in the future, the Bible says that if it comes to pass or not. That's how you know it's going to be a prophecy. But the false prophets like to use that. Now, have people had visions and dreams from God in the past? Absolutely. Yes, they have. King, the king of Egypt, you know, Pharaoh had a dream that Joseph was able to expound, and it was from God. Right? But that came to pass. Exactly the way that the dream was said. And there was no denying that. That came from God. But the false prophet's going to say, hey, so God talks to people in dreams? Guess what? I had a dream last night. Here's what God told me. And then, and then just, you know, a lot of people get buy into that. We need to prove all things. Verse 27, which thing to cause might be all. Verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness, yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. The false prophets don't profit, you know, the, the P-R-O-F-I-T, the people. They're not going to do good to the people. We shouldn't listen to the false prophets prophets because they're not going to do you any good at all. We need to beware of the preachers. Now, because we're going to say, well, how do I identify a false prophet? Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 7. You say, I, I get it, Pastor Berzins. You know, there's, there's false prophets are real. They're going to do all these things. They're going to be zealous, maybe. They're, you know, we need to test them. We need to prove them. We need to make sure what we're receiving, what we're hearing is right, that it's coming from God's Word. What are some of the signs of a false prophet. How can we tell? How could we know? Well, one example is beware of the preachers that never preach on sin. They never, ever preach on sin. We were just reading in Jeremiah how those false prophets were just preaching peace. Everything's good. Never saying anything bad. In Lamentations chapter 2, because Lamentations was also written by Jeremiah, Verse 14, the Bible reads, Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity, but have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. They explained away the reason that they were taken captive. They would not call out their sin and say, Look, 
You guys are in sin. You need to repent or else God's going to judge us, which is exactly what Jeremiah was preaching. The false prophets did not do that. He says they didn't do that. They have not discovered your iniquity. They haven't made it known to you. This is your sin. And it says the point of doing that is to turn away your captivity so you don't go into bondage. The preacher that preaches on sin preaches on sin because he wants to warn you. Don't get into bondage. Don't get into that sin. We're going to call it out by name. We're going to say, look, this is a sin, and we're warning you to stay away from it. If you're in it, get out of it. But the prophet that doesn't preach on sin ever, one, they don't care about you because they're letting you go into captivity. And two, they're just going to make up excuses anytime something bad happens that is a judgment from God. Like in this case, the children of Israel, they, they were taken captive as a punishment, as a judgment. And see, the, the important thing is, is that when they realize it was a judgment, they can say, wow, all of this stuff did come to pass. God is real. God, you know, we're being judged. Let's get back right with God. But when you have the false prophets saying, no, no, see, what happened is we had the wrong leader in charge. What happened is, see, these engineers that built our walls, they made this, this, this flaw. But that's not going to happen again. And then they start just, just, just pushing off the truth of you got judged. And when, when people have an excuse for what happened as opposed to from the truth, it's a lot less likely for them to get right with God. And that's what the false prophets do. They don't want you getting right with God. They're preaching. And you know what else they're doing? They're preaching things that you like to hear. People like to hear, I'm doing just fine. Everything's great. No problems here. All right. I'm doing good. I'm going to keep coming back to this place. They keep telling me how great I am. We need the warnings. Matthew chapter 7. How are we going to identify the false preacher? Well, the preacher that doesn't ever preach on sin, watch out. They don't warn. Matthew 7, 15. And this is important because this is in context. Knowing people by their fruits. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Again, on the outside they look like a brother. They look like a fellow sheep. But on the inside they're a ravening wolf. You shall know them by their fruits. Now, again, this is talking about false prophets. This is not talking about just every average person to know whether or not somebody is saved. This is talking about a false prophet knowing them by their fruits. What's a fruit? What are they bringing forth? Because, I mean, a prophet ought to have converts. They ought to be converting people to their way of thinking. When you have a pastor, you can judge their fruits based on their converts. Who are the converts? What's the, what's the fruits of their ministry? What, what is being produced? What is coming out of that ministry? It's a good way to judge them. That's how you know, well, they are a false prophet or not. If someone is teaching and preaching a false gospel, guess what? All of their converts are going to be teaching and preaching the same thing, what they've been taught. But when you got, and, and you know what the truth is, you say, okay, well, here's all the fruits. Here are the people. Here's, here's what's being taught. Here's what other people are going out and doing. That's a way that you judge them. You know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 17, Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. It is impossible for a saved, righteous, teacher, prophet, to bring forth a fruit that is evil, corrupt, and, you know, and, and whatever. Um, the same, well, that's not the fruit they're going to produce. When they produce fruit, see, if someone's going to the church and is a false brethren or someone who's, who was never saved to begin with, that's not the fruit of that preacher, Right? But when you're getting converts and, and, and converting people, that is your fruit. Now, 
it also the false prophet, they can't bring forth a believer either. They're not going to bring forth good fruit because a believer will be a good fruit. Hey, someone got saved. The false prophets don't get people saved. We need to look at that. And that's why it's important. We, we need to judge and prove where are we getting our source of information from? Where are we getting our teachings from? Who are these people? What are we allowing in? Uh, turn if you go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Identifying the false prophets. Another proof or another thing to, to, to look for, to be aware of is does everybody speak well of the, the, the prophet, of the person that you're listening to? Does the whole world just love him? Billy Graham, America's preacher. Are there people out there that hate Billy Graham? I mean, is that I mean wasn't wasn't he one of the one of the pastors that was like like inaugurating, you know, presidents for a while? I mean, I, I don't I don't I don't know all the history well, but I'm pretty sure he was, right? I mean he's accepted like that. Just like the, the Rick Warrens and Joel Osteen's. I mean, hey, everybody loves these guys, right? Everybody loves them. Well, look at what the Bible says. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse number 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. The way that God's prophets were treated... They were shamefully treated. Their name was cast out as a reproach. They were treated evilly. This is what he says, look, rejoice. If that happens to you for the cause of Christ, be happy about it. Leap for joy. Because that's exactly what they did to the prophets. Let's continue on here, verse 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall... Mourn and weep. Look at verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. The real prophets get their names cast out as evil. The false prophets are propped up and lifted up by everybody. Why? The world loves their own. The world loves a false prophet. No problems there. But the true prophets, the people who are preaching God's word, <laughs> they crucified Jesus Christ. I know I'm not more righteous than he was by any stretch of the imagination, not even close. He was hated, arrested, whipped, beaten, he came unto his own, his own received him not. He was handled shamefully and, and cursed by being hung on a tree. Cursed is every man that, that hangs on a tree, the Bible says. That's how he was treated. Can't get a better prophet than Jesus Christ, but look at how everyone else, look at how Jeremiah was treated. He was thrown in a dungeon. He was, he was left like in the sewage and given like stale bread and water drinking for a while. He wasn't given anything. And they had to come and arrest you. I mean, look at how they handled the men of God in the Bible. The people actually preached the truth. The world didn't love them. Oh, don't, can't we find any other man of God? You know, as the kings would say, Elisha, Elijah, they hate me. They're always prophesying against me. Let's listen to somebody else. All throughout the Bible, we see the difference between the false prophets who are accepted by the king and the real prophets who are calling them out. Like John the Baptist. It's not right for you to have your brother's, brother's wife to, to be your wife. They're hated. Why? Wow, they're calling out the sin. They're calling out the truth. Beware of the false prophets that everybody loves. I got to hurry up here. We're going overtime. Almost done. 
Make sure whoever you're learning from is saved. If you're learning anything about from the Bible, because you can't, you're not going to learn anything from someone who's unsaved. You're not. The Bible says that. Uh, I'm just going to. I'm going to read this for you real quick because we're running out of time. In First Corinthians chapter two, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. You have to have the God's Holy Spirit in order to teach and know the things of God. The unsaved person that's got the blinders on, they're not going to teach you on the things of God. They don't know God. They don't have the Spirit of God. The Bible says in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, that he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? You have to be instructed in the mind of the Lord and what God thinks. That verse finishes off, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the Spirit of God, and we have His Holy Word. We have the mind of Christ. But those that are not saved, the natural man, they don't know, they don't know God. They don't know anything about Him. Make sure that whoever you're reading, you know, whoever you're getting your source of information from, in spiritual things, I mean, look, I'm not talking about fiction. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, engineering books or whatever, you know, all this other stuff. But if you're going to get some learning about, you know, biblical concepts and th you know, things like this, make sure, and, and you know, it's not just books, it's teachers, it's YouTube, it's internet, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's whatever, whatever the source is. It doesn't matter what the media is, <coughs> what, what, which way, it, what format it comes to you in. Make sure the teacher is saved. I mean, would you like to read a book written by a Pharisee? It's like I mentioned about the Catholic priests or the Catholic popes or whatever. Jesus said in Matthew 23, Ye blind guides which strain in a net and swallow a camel. They're blind guides. They don't see. They are leading other people, though. They're false teachers. They're blind themselves. They strain in a net. It's another way to figure out, find a, small, a false prophet. They strain in a net and swallow a camel. What the false prophets will do, these false teachers oftentimes will get focused on all the wrong things, on all the little things, on all the minutiae, on all these, these little things. Like the Pharisees, they paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin, but omitted the weightier matters of the law and judgment. And, you know, like they're focused on such, the smallest thing. Like, I have this mint plant that grew in my garden. And I'm going to tithe on that. And, and, and we're going to make a big deal out of this. And we're going to, you know, like, like just, 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 this is what we're going to be focused on and talking about. Just completely forgetting, like, these, these much bigger matters. And Jesus said, you know what? These things ought you to have done. Like, it's great that you're paying attention to, the, to those small, you know, to the little detail or whatever. But not at the expense or cost of, of these others. He says, not, and not leave the other undone. And the false prophets will, will end up focusing in on these small things. That's what it is when you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. So if you're going to eat some food and, uh, oh, there's this gnat in my food. I'm trying to get it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strain out this gnat. I'm going to get this out. And the size of a gnat compared to a camel. He's saying, you're so focused on getting this one little tiny thing, right? Yet you're, you're, <laughs> you're receiving this huge problem. You have like, you're wrong on salvation. I mean, <laughs> who cares if you're paying the tithe on this little piece of mint? Get saved first. But that's what they'll, fo they'll focus on, all those little tiny things and, and omit the weightier matters of the law. Last point, can you learn about God's word from someone that's not even using God's word? There's a perversion. Okay, we have perversions of the Bible. We're not going to be learning about God's word when they're not, it's not even being used. Every word of God is important. And I covered this last week with, uh, with that sermon. But when you start using books that are perversions of God's word, you have inevitably introduced leaven that will infect your doctrine. We can see, and, and you, know, you start comparing all the different versions, where so many false doctrines can come from when you start reading what's written in those books. Because it's different. Because it says something different and it opens up the door for all kinds of false doctrine. Now, you may know someone to be saved. And they are saved, but they're using a perversion of God's word. I'm not going to listen to their teaching when they're teaching me. 
out of the ESV. When they're teaching me out of the NIV. I'm not going to listen to them. Even though if I know they're saved, their source is faulted. They've got leaven. And a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Beware of, of you know, where we get our stuff from. And look, again, d d I don't want to make it sound like this is the only place that you can get any teaching from. That's not what I'm saying at all. Let's just all be careful where and what word we're using. That's it. I mean, it's, it's, let's, let's, let's prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. When we find something that stands up and says, you know what? This isn't a false teacher. This person's saved. They're using the word of God. I believe they got the spirit of God. They're a teacher. They're qualified to teach. Okay. Great. You know, I think it's great that people listen to the sermons on YouTube or watch them or whatever, or listen, you know, listen to the MP3s. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. And if I ever write any type of material or, or publication or anything like that, I mean, I'd be writing it for people to read. I would think that's great too. Because I know myself, I know, I don't, I'm not a false prophet. I know I'm not a false prophet, but when I'm going to go out now and read other books, like you, you'll notice, I don't, you know, a lot of people throw names around. I don't know very many names. Honestly, like, like this is what I've spent my time studying and learning. I don't know a lot of who these various preachers are, these various pastors, big names even. I don't know them. Like, I don't, I don't know much about it at all. I've never studied them. I've never studied the people that much other than what I was forced to when I was growing up in a Presbyterian church of all the church fathers, you know, the John Knox and John Calvin and Wesley and, you know, all these, Martin Luther and all these various people, I've, you know, historical facts. I learned about them. But I don't go back and study like all the previous Baptists and what did they teach and what did they believe and everything. You know, I, I don't know. Him. I don't know Charles Spurgeon. I don't, I don't know him. I've heard different things about him, but I don't know who he was. I can't prove his ministry. Guy's long gone. But I have a more sure word of prophecy right here. Amen. And I'm going to get my answers from here. And, and, and you know what? Who I am going to listen to? is people that I can prove today. If I could prove an author, if I could prove a, a, a pastor or a preacher, if I could look at the fruits that they're producing, okay, I'll listen to what they have to say. I'll read it. Now, it doesn't automatically mean that it's right, but at least that's my starting point of what am I going to allow. And that's why, you know, we have materials here that's not directly from me. That, that we have as, as extra biblical content, extra biblical resources, but I know the source of those directly, personally, and I am the fruit of that ministry. So that's, what, that's why we have other things here. And again, I'm not against it, but make sure we're all being uh, diligent to make sure that, that what we're getting is, is at least um, going to be coming from someone that's of God. Let's borrow have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, all the admonishment that we have in your word and the, and the teaching and the instruction, dear Lord. Uh, I pray that you please help us all to gain wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we, we all need help. We all need encouragement. We need, we need to learn more. We need to be wise. God, we, we want to know what's right and to do what's right by you. I could safely say for everybody in the building right now, I believe that we all have this sincere uh, belief and, and, and um, zeal and desire to do what you want us to do. God, help us to, to get the right information and to be diligent in the things that, that we receive and that we could prove them. Lord, help us all not to be ignorant of your words, that we would do our own reading and studying of your word so that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by these, these false prophets that are using their craftiness to, to try to deceive us, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.